Okay, in this chapter we are now dealing with sound. Up to the, in a previous chapter we talked about waves, we talked about transverse waves that oscillate perpendicular to the direction of motion and we talked about longitudinal waves that oscillate in a direction along the direction of motion. In the case of sound, sound is a longitudinal wave. So here is an example, you've got a room, here is a window, there's another window, you suddenly open this window inwards and what happens is it creates a compression wave that travels across the room and then pushes this window outwards. Now if you were to then, this window that you had opened inwards, if you were to now to close the window, opening it in the other direction, that would create a rarefaction, the opposite of compression and that would then suck in this curtain or window inwards. So as you keep doing this, you will end up with a pressure wave that's alternatively, alternatively pushing the window outwards and inwards, outwards and inwards, right? So applying this to sound, if you had a tube and now we have a tuning fork, you hit the tuning fork and the fork is vibrating back and forth. So here the tines or the arms of the fork are vibrating back and forth. As they vibrate forward, they create a high pressure zone. As they vibrate backward, they create a low pressure zone. So you've got a high pressure, actually go in this direction. High pressure, low pressure, high, low, high, low, and so forth. So the low pressure zones are the rarefactions. The high pressure zones are the compressions. And we perceive these pressure waves as sound, right? Because you've got eardrums that, are, that oscillate back and forth in response to these pressure waves and we then have a series of bones and so forth that take the signal, right, the incus stapes malleus, that take that to the cochlea, right, which looks like a snail and the vibrations go down this and there are little fine hairs along the, the cochlea that then sense different frequencies or respond to different frequencies and it's actually a mind that does the send it sensing. Okay? So, in this picture again, reminding you that sound is a longitudinal wave. You have a speaker, that's the diaphragm of a speaker and at the back of the speaker you have a electromagnet. So here is the electromagnet and the diaphragm. The diaphragm can be made of paper or different materials. So, as the electromagnet, you send a current through this that's an oscillating current, what happens is the electromagnet, there's a permanent magnet and an ele electromagnet that move back and forth. The diaphragm is attached to the permanent magnet and so the diaphragm moves back and forth and creates a pressure wave that goes out, which is what is described here. So, you've got a vibrating loudspeaker sending out a pressure wave, high pressure, low pressure, low pressure, high pressure and so forth. Now we perceive, our ears perceive these pressure waves as sound. You can record this by placing a microphone here. The microphone itself has a diaphragm which responds to these pressure waves. So the diaphragm in the, mic in the microphone responds to the pressure waves. Now you could have, there are different kinds of microphones if you think in terms of a capacitive microphone as the diaphragm responds back and forth you will end up changing the capacitance between two metal plates and that can then result in a voltage that can be then displayed on a oscilloscope or it can be recorded, right? So here is the oscillating voltage that's resulting from the capacitive changes in the microphone as a result of the diaphragm in the mic microphone responding to the pressure waves that are coming from the loudspeaker. Next slide. Introducing the fact that sound waves can actually bend as the medium through which the sound is traveling becomes less dense or more dense. So here, for instance, is a situation where this person is whistling to his dog. This warm air here above the asphalt, cool air above. In a situation like this, the warm air, is it going to be less dense or more dense than the cold air? Less dense, right? So it's warmer, it's going to be less dense because as you heat up a gas, it expands, so it's going to be less dense. And what happens is the speed of sound becomes greater. Sound travels faster in the warm air than in the cool air. And as a result of this, you can think of, if you're driving your car in a particular direction, and what happens is all of a sudden, the wheels on the right side of your car 
they travel slower than the wheels on the left side of your car. What happens to your car when that happens? It starts pulling to the right, right? So if this side of the car is traveling slower and this is traveling faster, you start turning around, right? So to a first approximation, that's kind of what happens with waves as well. If one side of the wave, if you will, is traveling slower or rather faster and the other end is traveling slower, the wave bends, it curves. And so in a situation like this, you could think your dog is just, or your teenager, is just being obstinate, but it could very well be that the dog or the teenager is not hearing the call, right? So this is probably what happens when you tell your kids to, to clean their room, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> How to stay, stop playing their video games and actually get to studying. Now, if you had warm air above and cool air below, now what happens is, the wave travels faster up here, slower here, which means the wave curves downwards and the dog or the teenager hears the voice or the whistle. You're all familiar with ultrasounds, right? You can do ultrasounds, in this case, for to look at a baby in a mother's womb. So basically what's happening is you have a transducer, right, which is basically a little unit that vibrates with ultrasonic frequency and sends out an ultrasonic wave. So you could send the wave into the into the woman's womb and it bounces off of things that are inside and comes back up. So you'd have the, M, the transmitter as well as the receiver. So as you move this around, right, you can then end up with a picture in this case of a baby sucking its thumb and you can see uh, this the cra I mean you see the bone structure and all that kind of stuff, right? You can also use ultrasound to look at things like blood clots and so on. So if there's a question of a blood clot in a vein, then you could uh, use this same technique to you travel along the vein and look to see if there is a difference in the reflectivity. There's also a Doppler ultrasound that will look at the speed with which the blood is traveling through. And I think there's a reference to that in a future slide. Okay, so that's ultrasound. Ultrasound. Ultrasonic means ultra for higher than. So higher than sonic, high frequency. Frequency higher than what we can normally hear with our ears. Infrasonic is a sound that has a frequency that's too low to be heard by a normal human ear. So very large animals can hear sounds because the ears are bigger, right? So an elephant can hear sounds that we cannot hear. That's so low that we wouldn't hear it. And very high frequency sounds, things like dolphins and bats and so forth emit high frequency sounds and then they look at the reflection coming off of different objects around them and it's very possible that both bats and dolphins can actually integrate that information in the complete dark, in pitch dark, can integrate that inf information to get an idea of what's out there. It's almost like being able to see, but not with the same resolution that we are able to. You can be able to see that there's an object here, an object here, an object there, object there, and so on, but not with the kind of resolution we are able to with light. Okay, next slide, continuing on with ultrasound. So here's a part of, uh, in this case, dolphins that are basically, they emit high frequency waves, ultrasound waves, and then they're able to pick up the reflections. So this is how they're able to tell that there's like, when it's dark, there's fish out there to be eaten and so on, right? Okay, so ultrasound describes a sound that has a frequency that's too high to be heard by the normal human ear. The normal human ear can hear up to about maybe 20,000 cycles, so 20,000 hertz, 20,000 oscillations of the pressure waves per second. The low end is ballpark of about 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second. So anything less than 20, 20 hertz, 20 cycles per second, we cannot hear with our ears. But it looks like dogs can hear frequencies that are higher than 20,000. Maybe they can go to 50,000, 100,000 or something like that. That's why these ultrasonic whistles, right? That you whistle, you can't hear it, but the dog hears it. Everybody starts barking. Next slide. Introducing the concept of natural frequency and resonance. The natural frequency is the frequency that it's natural for the object to resonate at. So the, the best illustration of this is if you think of the uh, handbell choirs at Christmas time, right? So you know that, like if you look at the handbell choirs, you have a variety of different sounds of the, of the handbells. And you know that the biggest bells make the, the highest frequency. Lowest frequency sound, right? So dong, ding, dong, and then the small, the little ones do what? Highest frequency. <coughs> ding, 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 ding. 
right? So dinner bell is typically a very tiny little bell that goes. So what happens is the high frequency, high frequencies come from the little bell. The little bell is very small, so what happens is its wavelength, we could say to a first approximation, is like the size of the bell. So if the wavelength is the size of the bell, which is a small wavelength, its frequency is higher. And in the case like this, where the bell is very big, the wavelength is larger. So if the wavelength is larger, the frequency has to be low. So that's an illustration of natural frequency. Now every object up there has a natural frequency of some kind. And you can determine what the natural frequency is by hitting it and letting it resonate at its own frequency and listen to it. And you can pick up what's the natural frequency. You'll also pick up additional frequencies though. So resonance is a phenomenon where you're putting energy into the system at its natural frequency and that will increase the amplitude of its vibration. This classic example of this is you take a niece of your, or your nephew or your son or daughter to the playground, you put in this case of her on the swing and what happens? You push the swing so she oscillates up and comes down. Then you push again, oscillates up, comes down. So through this process you can start her off really slowly and as you keep putting more energy she keeps oscillating more and more, right? And uh, don't do this experiment at home. In principle if you put enough energy you could get her to go all around, right? Around the top and over again. Of course don't do this experiment and make sure, okay, whatever. So what happens is in a situation like this where you're putting the energy into the swing, you're doing this at the natural frequency. If we wait until the swing comes back to us before we push it again, right? So intuitively what we're doing is we are putting energy into the swing at the natural frequency where the swing goes up, comes back down, then we put energy, goes up, comes back down. Now if we were to, let's say we put the swing up here and instead of waiting for it to come all the way up here and then we push it, instead of doing that, we come and stand at the halfway point and then we try to push it. What happens? Yep, you hurt yourself, you hurt the kid, and what happens is you end up with a mess. Typically, like you basically stop the motion. So that's an example where you're trying to put the uh, energy into the system at a frequency that does not match the natural frequency, right? So to get the amplitude to increase, you have to put the energy at the natural frequency. And so an illustration of this was here, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Did we ever look at, see this in our lab? Did I ever play this for you guys? No. Okay, then at some stage I'll pull it up. This YouTube, there are multiple YouTube videos that show this resonance. Basically, this is a bridge in Washington, is my understanding. Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington that was built in 1940 across a particular, here's a river, and uh, there's a bridge across it. And what happened was, the bridge has a nat certain natural frequency. At a certain time, what happened, there were gusts of wind that came along, right? Here's a gust of wind, then a gust of wind and a gust of wind, and it just happened to match the natural frequency of the bridge. So what happened is the bridge, notice how the bridge is kind of twisting, right? So instead of the bridge just sitting here and doing its own thing, it started twisting in response to the gusts of wind that were coming along. And as the gusts continued, the amplitude of the twisting became, the torsion became so great that the bridge basically fell apart. So there's some pretty dramatic, isn't it amazing? And so what happens is, from this ex experience, people building bridges realize that you need to take that kind of stuff into account. You have to some, have some idea of what, what are the natural frequencies of the structure and you have to change the natural frequency by doing things to the bridge so that it doesn't match any of these natural natural frequencies like that of the wind. Yes. Did the dog survive or did it die? It went down. It, uh, it drowned? Okay. Okay, yeah, there was a car like stuck in the middle of the bridge. And there was actually a guy who went to try to save the dog. Oh, I see. Extra credit to you. I didn't realize that. Yeah, Madam Zoe? I'm sorry, I'm slow. I don't really understand how this works. So, mm -hmm. we're talking about sound. So, I, I, I just don't understand the okay. whole concept at all. Sorry. Earlier in the lecture, we were talking about sound, right? right? Now, we're discussing a phenomenon called resonance right. that can work with sound but also works with any of the, any wave. Okay. And so... So how did the wind, I mean how does the bridge have resonance, like how did the wind match? I don't understand that. Yes. Um, what happens is, well you know that if, if a breeze comes along it can blow, think of uh, laundry hanging on a clothesline, right? right? Or a, a sail on a, on a boat. The wind comes along and it blows the, the boat, right? And so what happens is the, the, the boat tips a bit. 
or the sales fill and they, they move along. Right. Um, now, I was just thinking, I mean, I, I had an experience with a sailboat a while ago, but I'm, uh, that's not de directly relevant to this. I was thinking to see if I could apply oh. that example. Um, <clears throat> The best example of resonance is the previous example that I talked about, where you're pushing your kid on the swing, right. right? And if you match, if you just keep on putting energy into the swing, the amplitude of the swing will go higher and higher until finally it, con it makes complete revolutions. And if you keep putting on more energy into that, what will happen is ultimately you'll get to the stage where you put so much en energy into this, the thing will just fall apart. Okay, so basically this was a swing that went all the way around and fell apart, but, mm -hmm. but bridge doesn't move. I mean. It's Built to be. Have you ever been? Good, good point. Have you ever been in a skyscraper, like in one of the big? Okay, um, it, there are many skyscrapers where if you go, like in some of the, like yes, and if it's if it's a windy day, you can actually feel the building, this enormous multi-ton building. You can feel it move. Really? Yes, it's a scary experience, okay. right? So the bridge has just a really slight natural kind of movement to it. Yes, like every matched it like it did with the swing and it. Yes, the bridge had a natural ability to move. Architects put put give into it so that when wind blows, it has a little bit of give, so it isn't just blown out of the back. Got it. Okay. Or yeah. And so, like similarly, like when you like in Japan, when you're building houses in earthquake zones, there are special architectural features that you incorporate into those because you do want the building to have a certain amount of give when there's an earthquake, but not so much that it falls apart, right? right? Okay. So, this is its natural ability to move of its own car, and in this, it just turned out that the wind was gusting at that particular frequency that I kept adding more and more energy into the bridge. So, mm -hmm. it, sorry, I'm going to beat this. It's okay. So, um, Extra credit for speaking up. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So you said that now they take that into account. Like, how do they, mm -hmm. how do they factor that in so that it doesn't happen? Like, how? yeah. Uh, what you'd have to do is you'd have to take measurements in that particular locale Absolutely. around the year or something. And so to get an idea of the kinds of uh, force that you get from the wind, kind of frequency and so forth. Then you can change the frequency of these. Um, an example of this. Now I've seen this done. Oh yeah, if you take a few tuning fork and you hit it. Right, you get a certain frequency. Right, Ding. now don't do this experiment. But if you add chewing gum to one of the tines, right, mm -hmm. what happens is it changes the frequency of it. So instead of going, it'll go, Ding. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what you've done is you've changed the mass, the conf mass, and the configuration of the mass of the tines, the arms of the tuning fork. So now the frequency has changed. So okay. similarly, in a bridge, you can put in reinforcements or change the mass of the bridge or the distribution of the bridge, of the weight in the bridge. Okay. to change the way it responds and what's its natural frequency. And these things you can model by something called finite element modeling, FEM, right? Good question, extra credits. Okay, so there, that was an illustration of resonance. Okay, we have seen the concept of interference, right? When it comes to waves before. Interference, Basically, when you have two waves, so the wave at the very top is a transverse wave because the motion of the wave is from left to right and the oscillation is up and down in a direction perpendicular to the motion of the wave, whereas the second wave is a pressure wave because in that case you've got high pressure, low pressure, and the oscillation is in a direction parallel to the direction of motion of the wave. So looking at the very top set of waves, if you have one transverse wave and another transverse wave that exactly matches it, add the two up, you end up with twice the amplitude in this example, right? If you have pressure waves, like here's a sound and there's a sound and they exactly match each other, what will happen is you have it have twice the amplitude of the sound, it becomes louder. It's like one person shouting, two per people shouting, the overall sound is much higher, right? To a first approximation. Now, if you were to take these two transverse waves and align them such, such that a peak on this wave matches a trough on this wave, you can get the two of these to exactly cancel each other out, so you end up with no resulting amplitude. So you just flat. Similarly with sound. Here's a pressure wave sound. You can get the exact opposite wave of that where there is a trough, you get a peak. Where there's a peak, you get a trough, you add them up, you end up basically with no sound. This is the principle behind you're probably aware, familiar with Bose noise cancelling earphones, right? So if you if you fly a lot, you can purchase these earphones that you just put them over the ear. It has a little microphone in the earphone that picks up 
the ambient sound, like the sound of the engines of the plane, and it creates, so let's say that here's the sound of the engines of the plane. There's electronics in the earphones that creates a signal. It senses this shape of the wave, creates the opposite signal, adds them up, and feeds that to your ear. So by this, it eliminates the bulk of the sound, right? So up to maybe 90% of the sound is supposedly eliminated, right? So here's an example of noise cancelling earphones on that person's head. Okay, introducing radio waves. So we're continuing to be on the topic of waves, right? Applied to sound and applications of sound. A carrier wave is a wave that carries something. What does it carry? It is used to carry a signal, right? So a carrier wave, in this case, it's usually a radio frequency wave, which is a high frequency wave that kind of looks like this, right? So it's, if you were to listen to it, let's say we bring it down to the frequency of sound and listen to it, it would be just a constant hum. Uh, that would be an example of a carrier wave, right? Now, I can modulate that carrier wave by doing this. Uh, Notice that I did not change the pitch. I did not change the frequency. What did I do? I changed the amplitude, the sound, the, the volume of the sound. Uh, right? So that would be amplitude modulation. Right? So amplitude modulation, modulation is where you're taking a second signal and putting it on the carrier wave. Amplitude modulation is where here's the, the, the signal, here's the carrier wave, you put this on top of that and you end up with a carrier wave going up and down and up and down in amplitude while its frequency remains the same. There's a different kind of modulation called frequency modulation. So in frequency modulation, here's what you do. Here's the carrier wave. Uh, okay. Um, that's the carrier wave. Um, I'm going to modulate it in terms of frequency. <laughs> yes, which is exactly what a, what a donkey does. It generates a carrier wave and then it modulates its frequency. Right? So, so do you notice what's happening with this kind of modulation? The frequency of the wave is going up and going down, and then up and down and so forth, right? So, again, the, the signal is the same. Here's the signal wave, here's the carrier wave, and now you superpose the two in such a way that the frequency is modulated, not the amplitude. See, the amplitude is remaining the same in this case, but the frequency is changing. High frequency, low frequency. So high frequency where you have a peak, low frequency where you have a trough, high frequency where you have a peak, and so forth, right? So that is frequency modulation. And we use this technologically in AM and FM radio. So here is an example where AM radio Here's a signal, there's a carrier wave, you put the signal onto the carrier wave, you end up with a wave like this, you send it over the atmosphere, and here's noise coming from the atmosphere due to like lightning and stuff like that, right? So the noise gets superimposed on this and it distorts the amplitude. When this comes to the receiver, the receiver clips, it removes the bottom and looks at just the top and reconstructs this wave from that based on the amplitude. So you can see that this wave in amplitude modulation is distorted compared to the input wave. Here's the signal wave, and here is the received wave. It's distorted. Now, in frequency modulation, what happens is, same thing, carrier wave, rather the signal wave, put on top of the carrier wave, creates the composite wave, where the frequency is changing, but the amplitude is not. Electrical noise is in the atmosphere due to lightning and electrical motors and all kinds of stuff modulates the amplitude of this wave. In the case of FM radio, what you do is you get the signal and you clip off the top. So now you have a uniform amplitude, but you still have the frequency changing. You then remove, you strip that information from this wave to regenerate this wave, and the wave is much more, it has higher fidelity. It looks more like this wave compared to the AM wave. And this is the reason why High fidelity, like music that you want to listen to, that you don't want a bunch of distortion on, is typically on FM radio. Talk radio, where it's just human voices and it doesn't matter that much if there's distortion, tends to be on AM radio. Why do they what? What's the point of AM radio? At all? Yeah, well, part of the problem is that there are more radio stations than there's available bandwidth commonly. Okay. So, 
so you can stop using AM altogether. Or what you can do is you can just sell it to people who, I mean, the government sells licenses to people who like are doing talk radio where really the quality of the sound doesn't matter as much. Isn't AM also like more broad, like, like the FM channels we pick up here mm -hmm. are different everywhere, whereas like AM, mm -hmm. no matter where you are, AM is AM. That's a good question. It could very well be that AM radio has a larger range than FM radio. I haven't looked into that. Extra credit, if you look it up and let me know, right? So that could very well be the case, that AM radio has a broader range and that you may need more repeater, repeater stations for, a, for FM. Possible. I'm sorry, what? For a given amount of transmit power, you can give more range radio. Out of AM radio? Okay. Extra credit to you which would be consistent with what you just said, yeah. right? Okay. Okay, introducing the concept of beats. This is most easily illustrated by the tines, which is the teeth, of a couple of plastic combs. If you superpose, right, two combs, what happens is, and let's say that they have different spacing in the, between the teeth, you will, here's one comb, here's a second comb, and where they overlap, you can see that there's a beat frequency, right? You can see places where more of these teeth match these teeth and then less do. So there's a greater density, lower density, greater, lower, greater, do, lower density in turn. That phenomenon is called beats. You can actually hear it where you have two tuning forks that are putting out sounds with a slight difference in their wavelength. Here's one fork that's putting out this sound wave, the other fork is putting out this wave and when you add them up what happens is this peak in intensity or density is cancelling out this trough, whereas in this case, the two peaks line up. In this case, the peak matches the trough. So here you have constructive interference, here you have destructive interference. So destructive, destructive interference, constructive. So you notice an increase in the volume here and here, and a drop in the volume here and here. And this will create a thrumming kind of a sound, which you call beats and beat frequencies. Okay? So a reminder for you to go through the multiple choice questions.